talking about <coughs> Wesley's doctrine of sin and grace, and we've been discussing uh, original sin and its consequence uh, upon humanity. Uh, and so, Wesley's conclusion of this discussion, Wesley's conclusion of this discussion, can be expressed uh, in a number of things that he has written. And so I want to read to you uh, what Wesley taught in this area in terms of a conclusion. That if we consider what Wesley calls the natural person, and the natural person, you have to understand this clearly, the natural person is a person apart from all the grace of God. So if we consider a person apart from all God's grace, what does that look like? Okay, what does that look like? And Wesley is going to argue that the natural man is wholly corrupted, uh, that sin has now become natural, uh, and that holiness is not so. Holiness is not so. Um, he's also going to argue that the whole nature is corrupted, therefore the whole nature, the whole nature must be renewed. It must be renewed. Okay? And so if we take a look at Wesley's sermon on original sin, because he not only wrote a very large treatise on original sin, but he also wrote a smaller sermon. And Again, he's talking about the natural person, the natural man. Sometimes he uses that expression. Sometimes he uses the natural state. And by that, he means a person apart from all grace. And, and here's what he writes. From all these we learn concerning man in his natural state, unassisted by the grace of God that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart is evil, only evil, and that continually. Okay. And so we're seeing here the extent, the extensiveness and the depth, uh, the consequences of sin uh, in, in the life. So he raises this question in the sermon, but was there not any good? Any good mingled, mingled with the evil? Listen to Wesley now. No, none at all. None at all. God saw that the whole imagination of the heart of man was only evil. Okay? Uh, and so Wesley understands uh, original sin essentially as unbelief, as unbelief. Uh, radical alienation, separation from God, out of that unbelief arises sinful pride, sinful pride, the curving in on oneself. Uh, so, apart from the grace of God, apart from the grace of God, Wesley's going to write, we are all atheists in the world, for God is not in our thoughts. Uh, we are marked by pride and self-will, love of the world, desire of the eye, desire of the flesh, uh, and the pride of life, okay? Um, now, Wesley's going to make sure that we get the point, and so he's going to emphasize it, and here's what he writes in terms of emphasis. Allow that humanity is wholly fallen, and you are so far a Christian Deny it, and you are but a heathen still. And so Wesley is making this a crucial issue. Uh, he affirms in his doctrine of the fall that Adam and Eve were wholly fallen. They were totally corrupted. And so humanity is wholly fallen. Uh, and if you deny that, if you deny that they are wholly fallen, Wesley's going to argue you are but a heathen still. So you can see how important this teaching is to the Christian faith. Okay? Uh, so we see 
again, uh, Wesley using language when he's describing the fall that looks very similar to Calvin, to John Calvin. He writes again, for example, quote, Know that thou art corrupted in every power, in every faculty of thy soul, that thou art totally corrupted in every one of these, all the foundations being out of course. Wesley writes that in his sermon, uh, The Way to the Kingdom. So you can see when he's describing the fall and when he's describing the natural person or the natural state, that is, what is a human being apart from all the grace of God, he brings out all these negative superlatives, totally fallen, utterly corrupted, etc., uh, etc. Et and so... Uh, there are two conclusions, two conclusions that come out of Wesley's doctrine of original sin. Because original sin is the effect, the consequence, what is communicated to all of humanity through the fall. And there are two consequences here that help us to understand original sin. First, the first to help us understand original sin all people, all people stun, stand under the condemnation of God with but one exception. That one exception is? Jesus. Right. Okay, so that's the first conclusion in terms of the doctrine of original sin. All people stand under the condemnation of God. First thing. Second, the second conclusion here that arises out of Wesley's doctrine of original sin, that... People uh, cannot bring about redemption by themselves. People cannot bring themselves back into a right relationship to God. They cannot do that by themselves. We expressed that before in other language. We said uh, that people cannot solve this problem because they are the problem. <laughs> they are the problem. Uh, they are in a perverted relationship to God. And so, you know, when we hear this language in Wesley, these negative superlatives of totally fallen, utterly corrupted, uh, it does indeed sound like John Calvin. And indeed, in the early 20th century, there was a professor, uh, uh, Professor Sell, uh, uh, who wrote a book, uh, The Rediscovery uh, of Wesley, and he argued that Wesley's doctrine of original sin was extremely similar to that of Calvin and Luther. Uh, and this is what George Croft Sell wrote uh, at that time in the early 20th century. He wrote this, quote, The doctrine of sin as developed by Wesley is entirely faithful to historic Christianity planting his feet identically in footprints made by St. Paul, Augustine, Luther, Calvin. Uh, and so that's what George Croft Sell has argued. But I have to ask the question, you know, is Wesley really similar uh, to John Calvin? Uh, on the doctrine of original sin? I think we have to answer that yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, the yes part you're already familiar with. You've heard the language of total depravity, that kind of thing. Uh, and although both Wesley and Calvin have a doctrine of total depravity, uh, there are some important differences uh, to be to be seen here. There are some important differences that we have to take into account because the question is this. We've described total depravity, utter corruption in terms of the person in the natural state that is apart from all grace. And so now we ask the question, is there anyone, is there anyone who has no grace of God? Is there anyone apart from all grace of God? In other words, today, for example, is there anyone apart from all the grace of God? 
Uh, and Wesley's answer is no. Because every person, and this gets to your question earlier, every person, even those outside the church, have a measure of grace. And we speak about grace as the presence of God in our lives. That's what grace is. That's a way of understanding grace. Grace is the presence of God in our lives and the consequences thereof. Um, and <clears throat> Wesley is going to maintain um, that there is no person who is apart from all grace because in the wake of sin, in the wake of total depravity, utter corruption, if God does not act, if God does not act first and give prevenient grace, then salvation is not possible. Now, salvation is not possible because you're dead in your sins. You're utterly fallen, totally corrupted. You're not even in a condition of being savable. Okay? You're utterly fallen, totally corrupted. And so, God will act first. That's why it's called prevenient grace. That grace which goes before. God is always ahead of us. God is always ahead of us. And God preveniently uh, gives grace so that there's not a man or woman today who does not have a measure of grace. So, in terms of your example earlier, my uh, that person who you know who is good and moral, that goodness that they have, what goodness that they have is also come from God because God is the center of all goodness. The problem is they don't acknowledge its source. Okay. And so, for example, when they love their children, they love their children. That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. That is a species of prevenient grace. What is its source? Where does it come from? It comes from God. It comes from God. And, and God's grace is in their lives, but it's not being recognized or acknowledged. Or take the example, because we used this example earlier. You know, we use the example of the alcoholic, you know, the alcoholic who is struggling, you know, and then who finally gets sober. You know, they finally get sober uh, and they say, you know, I, I don't believe in God. I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I don't want that, that God language, none of that. Uh, but they get sober. And so what is that? That too is grace. It's prevenient grace. And watch this. The the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is so good and gracious and merciful that God breaks bondages even when people don't acknowledge God. That's how good God is. That's how merciful that God is. Okay? And so when, when that alcoholic gets sober and we rejoice in that, that's a wonderful thing. When that happens, that happens as a consequence of grace, prevenient grace. It is the prevenient grace of God, whether that grace is acknowledged or not uh, in the life of that person. God is the source of every good. God is the source of every good. If you're talking about a genuine good, it has a connection to God. Uh, some people are willing to acknowledge that connection, Others, no. We in the church, we glorify God because of what God has done, the goodness of God. So, listen to Wesley then, in, as he's describing prevenient grace here. No man who is alive is without prevenient grace. And every degree of grace is a degree of spiritual life. Uh, and so... You know, when we speak about the purely natural person who is apart from all grace, well, you know, that person uh, doesn't exist. Uh, kind of, it's a kind of theoretical construct, if you will, doesn't exactly exist because every person today has a measure of grace, whether that grace is acknowledged in terms of its source or no. Now, 
by Wesley's doctrine of prevenient grace, and I'm going to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in a number of ways uh, in a few moments. But I, I just want to make uh, some preliminary observations. But by his doctrine of prevenient grace, Wesley held together. He could affirm the notion of total depravity. Okay, he affirms total depravity. That would be a person apart from all grace. He can also affirm that salvation is by grace through faith alone. He can affirm that. Uh, he can also affirm the offer of salvation is to all. It's to all people. And all people, not just Christians, all people are given prevenient grace. All people are given prevenient grace. And with the giving of prevenient grace, that renders us responsible. That renders us responsible and accountable. In other words, having received some grace, we can do something. So Wesley writes in a, in a sermon later on on working out our own salvation. And he writes in that sermon, God works, therefore you can work. God works, therefore you must work. Okay. In other words, that Grace, the reception of grace, the giving of grace implies responsibility and accountability in some sense. Okay? Uh, so, Wesley's doctrine of prevenient grace then, um, let, me, let me do it this way. I'm going to stand up uh, just so uh, I need to walk around, move around, not just sit all the time. Um, I want to talk about prevenient grace now. Because prevenient grace is what's going to make Wesley's theology different from the theology of John Calvin. It's going to make Wesley's theology different, we'll take questions later, different than the theology of Martin Luther, okay? Uh, and so, in terms of prevenient grace, I want to speak initially in terms of Prevenient grace means, in the first sense, that God is always ahead of us. God is always ahead of us. God is always ahead of us. Uh, prevenient meaning, literally, that which comes before. God is always before us. When we think of salvation, it is not we, but God who takes the first step. It is God who takes the first step. We are wallowing in sin, okay? Now, I want to talk about prevenient grace in a second sense, a prevenient grace in a second sense. Um, and in the second sense, by prevenient grace, I mean, uh, we could put the word, the English word, prevenient, pre, meaning before, and then this venient part coming from the Latin, you know, Caesar veni, veni vidi vici, I came, I saw, I conquered, you know, coming, literally coming, uh, that which comes before, that which comes before, that which comes before what? That which comes before salvation, properly speaking. So provenient grace comes before justifying and regenerating graces, okay? Provenient grace comes before justifying and regenerating graces, okay? Uh, and so, in that second sense, provenient grace is literally that grace which comes before salvation, properly speaking. Are those who have provenient grace, are they redeemed? The answer is no. Because prevenient grace, though it is a measure of grace, and though it is universal, okay, it does not imply redemption. Uh, because uh, redemption would entail what graces would entail redemption? Justification and regeneration. In other words, the reception of the forgiveness of sins and the transformation of nature in terms of holiness. Okay, are you with me so far? I realize, you know, this could be a rough roller coaster ride. Hold on, hold on to the straps now. 
Uh, now we're going to the third level, and this is we're going to spend some time with this, and you're going to see lots of practical application. We're going to take questions at the the prevenient? The question mark. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'm just simply saying that, you know, what is prevenient grace before? And I said prevenient grace is before salvation, properly speaking. So it is before justification. It is before regeneration. So those are, uh, in other words, this, this, is the answer to the question, okay? This is the answer to the question, okay? So if you understand it that way. Um, so now we're ready for the third part, okay? All right, and now we have to express, talk about prevenient grace. Prevenient grace in terms of restored faculties restored faculties. What does that mean? What does that mean, restored faculties? Okay, watch this. You already know Wesley's teaching on the fall and original sin. And what's the result? Utterly fallen, totally corrupted, okay? So, what must God do? God must act. And cover your Methodist ears. How must God act? Sovereignly. God must act sovereignly. In other words, the work of God alone. God alone does this. So a part of prevenient grace is going to be understood as free grace. Free grace represents gift. It represents the work of God alone. What is God going to do sovereignly in the face of human sin and corruption? where one is utterly fallen, totally depraved. God is going to preveniently restore and give what? Give a measure of freedom. That we now have a measure of freedom. Now, it's not absolute freedom, but it's a measure of freedom. And, and in my theology, this is not Wesley's theology, but my theology, uh, in order to be a human, a human being, you have to have freedom. It's integral involved of who we are as persons. You'd have to have freedom. So what does that mean? Well, in my theology, at least anyway, uh, original sin is so devastating that we're moving away from really what it means to be a person. We're moving so far away from the image of God, okay? And so God acts sovereignly. God restores a measure of freedom. What kind of freedom is that? It's the freedom to receive the grace of God. We have the freedom to receive the further, further grace of God. We could receive the grace of God or no, okay? So we have that kind of freedom, okay? Um, so let me, let me explain that for you again uh, in language, in a way you might understand by an example, okay? Um, I do not, I, well, let, let me back up. Let's use... Let's use the example of someone addicted to something, whatever. You know, I don't want to pick on alcoholics because we've been using that so often, but uh, they are addicted to something. Uh, and this gets us in the area of practical Christian discipleship and good counseling, you know, that sort of thing. And the question is, when they are in the throw uh, of their bondages, do they have freedom? Uh, do they have the freedom to stop by their own power? Uh, no. No. No, they don't. Uh, and indeed, they would be referred to by many 12-step programs as powerless. Powerless, you see. But we still hold them responsible. So if someone goes out, gets drunk, and gets in a car and kills somebody, we hold that person responsible. They could have done otherwise. We understand that very much in the church. They could have done otherwise how? By the grace of God. They were free to receive the grace of God by means of which they could have done otherwise. And so we can hold them responsible, you see? So this freedom that we're talking about here, it's not human autonomy. It's not, oh, I have free will. I have free will, and I'm free to do this, and I'm free to do that. 
No, the deeply addicted person is corrupted in the center of their being. They don't have that kind of freedom uh, while they're in the midst of their addiction, okay? They're a slave, they're powerless, they're in bondage, but they still have freedom. They have the freedom to receive the grace of God by means of which they can be set free. Do you see the difference? It's that kind of freedom we're talking about here. God restores that freedom. God gives the one dominated by sin this freedom. You have freedom enough to receive the grace of God. And through receiving the grace of God, you can be really free. Free indeed. Free from alcohol, cocaine, internet pornography, whatever it is that you know, someone is addicted to or caught up in. You see? Um, so, but what else does God restore? Conscience. Do you have a conscience? Uh, do you do things? And even people who care nothing about God, do they do things and their conscience bothers them? Where does conscience come from? Wesley said it comes from God. God gives conscience sovereignly, even before we're aware even before we're aware that it's present, God gives conscience. We have a conscience. That conscience is the presence of God in the personality. Remember I talked about grace as the presence of God. Conscience is a, a species of prevenient grace. It is the presence of God in our lives. Now, that conscience, that conscience has a standard it has a standard, a rule, a norm, or judgment. So, for example, the conscience is making judgment. Oh, what you did there was wrong. Uh, what I did there was okay. Well, what's the standard? It is the moral law. It is the moral law which has been restored in the person in some sense, to some degree. That God restores the moral law in some sense, in the lives of sinners, so that the conscience has a standard by which it makes judgment, okay? So we are talking about the faculties of prevenient grace, first in terms of freedom, first in terms of freedom, secondly, uh, in terms of conscience, Thirdly, in terms of a restoration of the moral law, in some sense, in some sense. And then we speak fourthly, the fourth aspect of prevenient grace in terms of faculties that are restored would be a certain knowledge of the attributes of God. Attributes of God. In other words, uh, there should be, there should be this sense in all people that there is in existence someone greater than ourselves, that, uh, that God exists. Now, this knowledge which is restored by grace can be denied, it can be stifled, it can be suffocated, rejected, whatever, but Wesley argues it is restored in some sense, that as Paul talks about in Romans 1, we should have a sense of God through the things that have been made. That too is a species of grace. So what do we have then? What do we have? We have with the giving of the faculties of prevenient grace, we have now accountability and responsibility because people can do otherwise not by their own talents, abilities, or efforts, but through the grace of God, which is now present in their lives. In terms of these four faculties of prevenient grace, God gives them to whom? Just Methodists? Just Christians? Who does God give this grace to? All. All. That's right. Everyone. Everyone is a recipient of these things. A certain measure of freedom, it's not total freedom, it's a certain measure of freedom, the freedom to receive the grace of God, 
conscience, having a conscience, uh, knowledge of the moral law, meaning that the moral law is operative in the conscience as a standard, making judgment. Okay, and then there is knowledge of the basic attributes of God, that, that God exists. So, that means then, with prevenient grace, with prevenient grace, uh, with the giving of grace before justification and regeneration, uh, that we can do something. And so Wesley's theology is going to be different from the theology of John Calvin and also Martin Luther. Here's how. You've heard me talk a lot about free grace. And this, by the way, is a species of free grace. This prevenient grace is given sovereignly by God. It's the work of God alone. We don't give ourselves our, you know, our own conscience, that faculty. That's given to us by God. Okay? Uh, and so there's going to be a difference here between Wesley's theology of prevenient grace uh, and then the theology of Luther and Calvin because Wesley now has this understanding of cooperant grace. Cooperant grace, what does that mean? That's, that means when we work together with God, divine and human cooperation. So, Wesley wrote the sermon on working out our own salvation. As I noted before, God works, therefore you can work. God works, therefore you must work. So let's say, for example, someone came to Wesley. You know, he's, he's pastoring, he's preaching. They came to Wesley and they said, you know, John Wesley, uh, I heard you preach on the market square the other day and I was greatly moved. I am not a Christian, uh, but I would like to become a Christian. I would like to enter into this path. What shall I do? Do you think John Wesley would say, well, you know, just fold your hands, do nothing, wait until you have faith? Uh, no. John Wesley is going to tell that person, which he did in his counseling, uh, you can do something. Why? Because God's grace is already in your life. God's a prevenient grace is already in your life. You can do something because God has already worked. God works, therefore you can work. God works, therefore you must work. So what can you do? Well, you can serve the poor. Uh, you can minister to people's needs. Uh, you can go to church. Uh, you can study the Bible. You can pray. You can fast. You can uh, engage in Christian conference. You can do all of these things as a means of grace, meaning that they will be the channels through which God will communicate further grace, subsequent grace. Okay? Uh, and so... Here we find Wesley's understanding of cooperant grace. So prevenient grace leads into cooperant grace. We are empowered because God has already worked. We can do something, uh, you know, and so we can uh, do good, leave off evil, and be in the means of grace, which are the three things of the general rules. So. Wesley's theology here, therefore, is very different from the theology of John Calvin and very different from the theology of Martin Luther because they don't talk about cooperant grace prior to justification and regeneration. Because why? They were fearful that if you talk about human doing before justification and regeneration, you would despoil or ruin justification and regeneration. But Wesley doesn't have that problem because he's arguing that with prevenient grace, we can do something, but prevenient grace is not saving grace. It's not a matter that uh, we will be justified on the basis of what we do. It's rather that we will receive the grace of God uh, through the means of grace. So that's an important difference. And so in the end, we have to say, we have to say that John Wesley and John Calvin's theology are very, very different.
okay? They're very different. And that difference can be expressed in terms of uh, prevenient grace, prevenient grace. Uh, okay, let's see here. Um, now, in its best sense, after we receive prevenient grace, it should result in what kind of grace? What's the next step along the way? Well, yeah, prevenient grace is cooperant grace, but convicting grace. Well, something before, something before saving grace. Think of it. Think of a person who has conscience. Think of a person who has a certain knowledge of the moral law. They realize they've done wrong. They have guilt in their lives. They, they know something's wrong. They want the goodness of the gospel, okay? So what's happening? The Holy Spirit... Conviction, that's right, conviction, conviction. And that is another way of saying prevenient grace. It's convincing grace. That's what prevenient grace is here. It's convincing grace. In other words, the Holy Spirit is using the conscience and knowledge of the moral law that has been restored by God and is convicting that sinner, you need Jesus Christ. You need Jesus Christ. Okay? So we call that grace convincing grace. Convincing grace. And convincing grace is another way of saying cooperant grace because we are cooperating with God. There's divine human cooperation. The Holy Spirit is convicting us. We are receiving that conviction and being in the means of grace. Okay? So prevenient grace usually leads in the best sense to convincing grace. What's another name for convincing grace? I think we can use this here, repentance. In other words, one is repenting. One says, okay, I agree. I have done wrong. I have fallen short of the glory of God. I have guilt in my life. My conscience bothers me. I want another way. Uh, I want to go a different direction. Metanoia. Genuine turning about and change. That's what we mean by repentance. Metanoia, going a different direction. And convincing grace leads to that. Convincing grace leads to that. And so prevenient grace usually leads to convincing grace or repentance. And how does it often lead that, to that? Through the power of preaching or teaching and the Holy Spirit using that word to convict the sinner and to show them their need of Jesus Christ, okay? And so, when Wesley gave counsel to his preachers, okay, how should you preach in the church when you first come to a new environment and you know nothing about the people? He said to him, he wrote to this, at our first beginning to preach at any place, after a general declaration of the love of God to sinners, preach the law. The law, what does he mean by the law here? The moral law. In the strongest, the closest, the most searching manner possible. In other words, preach the moral law and the Holy Spirit can use that moral law in order to convict the sinner, in order to convince the sinner and show them their need of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, if you take a look at Wesley's sermon, uh, he wrote actually four key sermons on the moral law, and all those sermons are in the new book that has been translated into Estonian. In other words, Wesley's 52 standard sermons, all those four sermons are there. It's the original nature, property, uses of the law, that's Sermon 1. The law established by faith, Discourse 1. The law established by faith, Discourse 2. And then Sermon on the Mount, uh, Discourse 5. Um, those are four sermons, all on the moral law. And in that first sermon, that is the original nature and property and uses of the law, when we take a look at this first sermon, Wesley argues that the moral law, and you know what I mean by moral law now, because we've, we've gone over that, has three uses. It has three uses. The moral law has three uses. What's the first use of, of the moral law? To convince the world of sin. 
to convince the world of sin. In other words, to show the world of their need of Christ, that they have fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, so that's a use of the moral law. So it's law and spirit or word and spirit. That's the combination here, word and spirit. The Holy Spirit uses the word, uses the moral law to bring conviction, conviction of sin. Then secondly, uh, secondly, the moral law is useful to bring that person to Christ. And so the moral law points, points to Christ and indeed helps to bring the person, bring the person to Christ. And then thirdly, when Wesley's talking about the uses of the law, thirdly, when Wesley's talking about the use of the law, he's talking about that the law keeps us alive. It keeps us alive. And by this understanding of the moral law, Wesley means that we look into the moral law for wisdom. We look into the moral law for illumination, for guidance. How shall we live? What shall we do? How shall I relate to my neighbor? We look into the moral law for wisdom as the express will of God so that we might walk uh, and continue in the way that God has ordained. And so Wesley says, the third use of the moral law is to keep us alive. And that's what we call technically the prescriptive use of the law. It's called tertius uses. Calvin has it, Wesley has it, but Luther doesn't have this understanding of the law though the subsequent Lutheran tradition does, especially in the formula of Concord, okay? So what's gonna happen here? The law is gonna have its effect through the Holy Spirit in conscience. It's gonna have its effect in conscience. People are going to become convinced that they deserve nothing but the wrath of God, uh, and this is going to lead to poverty of spirit, um, a kind of teachableness that Wesley himself had when he came back from Georgia. He was open, he was teachable. Uh, this is what will happen through the work of the Spirit. It leads to humility, to openness, to teachableness. Uh, it leads to the conviction of sin and it leads to repentance. It leads to repentance, okay? Uh, so, now we can raise the issue, and it's an important issue. So let's say, let's say Wesley's counseling that person. That person came to John Wesley. You know the story. He says, I'm not a Christian, but I want to become a Christian. Wesley gave him counsel. He said, you know, leave off good. Uh, I mean, leave off evil, do good, and be in the means of grace. The person is doing those things, okay? And now... As they're in these things, which correspond to the general rules of the United Societies, these three councils, all of a sudden now they are convicted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is convicting them in their heart and in their conscience that they have fallen short. They have fallen short. And so now they are repenting. They are turning. They are turning towards God in a new way by God's grace. What should they do? Should they, should they do nothing? Should they fold their hands and say, well, I don't want to despoil faith. I heard that we're justified by grace through faith alone, so I'm going to do nothing. I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not going to serve the poor. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to engage in Christian assembly. I'm not going to fast because those are works. Those are, those are works, and I don't want to corrupt justification by grace through faith alone. So I'm going to do nothing. Okay. Uh, do you think Wesley would agree with that, with that answer? No. No. And, and notice that Wesley can disagree with that answer without arguing salvation by works. How so? Because why? God has already acted. You have already received provenient grace, convincing grace. 
you can do something. You can be in the means of grace. You can do, you can engage in repentance and watch this. Works suitable for repentance. So Wesley would counsel that person. Are you not redeemed yet? Okay. And you're in the process of repenting? Good. Then do works suitable in accordance with repentance. Those works will not be the basis upon which you are justified, but they may very well be the means through which God can communicate justifying grace. Do you understand the difference? Do you understand the difference? Okay. Um, and so, when the Methodist Conference, the first Methodist Conference in 1744, addressed this issue, uh, in answer to the question, listen to the question that the first Methodist Conference dealt with in 1744. Must not repentance and works meet for repentance? That's Wesley's language, suitable for repentance. Must they not go before faith? And here's what the conference stated, quote, without doubt, if by repentance you mean conviction of sin and by works meet for repentance, obeying God as far as we can, forgiving our brother, leaving off from evil and doing good and using his ordinances. Okay, so that's Wesley, that's the, the council of the First Methodist Conference. In other words, are you receiving convincing grace, prevenient grace? Are you in the process of repentance? Then you can do something. You can do works suitable for repentance, okay? And those works suitable for repentance that you're doing, leaving off evil, doing good, being the means of grace, again, they will not be the basis upon which you're justified because we're justified by grace through faith alone but they will be the means through which God can communicate further grace to us, okay? Now, um, this, I said to you earlier, Wesley lived a paradigmatic life, okay? He lived a life that functions as a good example of what to do and what not to do, because Wesley made a number of mistakes uh, in his life, but in this area, it was not Wesley making the mistake. It was actually, this time, the Moravians. The Moravians at Fetter Lane. Remember I talked to you earlier about the joint Moravian Methodist Society at Fetter Lane that was established in 1738 by Wesley and Peter Burla? Okay. There's now trouble. There's now trouble uh, at Fetter Lane because some of the Moravians are teaching. They're teaching that if you are not justified, if you do not know you're a child of God, if you're not justified or born of God, do nothing. Do nothing. In other words, don't go to church. Don't fast. Don't use private prayer. Don't read the Bible. Uh, and do not do temporal and spiritual good. So people like Malther and Bray were teaching this at Fetter Lane. They said, you know, do you know your sins are forgiven? And if you answered no, then they said basically fold your hands. Fold your hands and wait for saving grace. And, and they claimed that this was the teaching of Martin Luther and that this is what justification by grace through faith alone means. But of course, this is not Luther. This is a distortion of Luther. What do we call this? There's a name for it. We call it quietism. Quietism. Leaving off all the means of grace, um, thinking that if we were involved in any way in the means of grace, uh, that that would corrupt or despoil justification. Okay? Uh, and so Wesley dealt with this he dealt with this uh, at the Fetter Lane Society. So there was a historical context out of which this teaching, this mature teaching of Wesley emerged. Uh, and so Malther's position at Fetter Lane resulted in what? 
extreme passivity. In other words, do nothing, fold the hands. Uh, it resulted in still, another, another name for this is not just quietism, but stillness. In other words, be still, do nothing. Because we, we don't want to corrupt justification by grace through faith alone. And we're just going to have to wait for it doing nothing because we can't do any works at all. But in Wesley's theology, you can do something. Why? Because God has already acted. God has given prevenient grace. God works, therefore you can work. God works, therefore you must work. Okay? Um, and so Wesley is underscoring the importance of proper means here. Uh, and this is what, how Wesley summarizes this teaching in his sermon, The Scripture Way of Salvation, which was written in 1765. This is what he writes, quote, God <coughs> does undoubtedly command us both to repent and to bring forth fruits meet for repentance, which if we willingly neglect, we cannot reasonably expect to be justified at all. Therefore, both repentance and fruits suitable for repentance, the word Wesley uses here is meat, but that's 18th century language, uh, works, fruits suitable for repentance are, here's Wesley's language, in some sense, in some sense necessary to justification, but they are not necessary, they are not necessary in the same sense with faith nor in the same degree with faith, okay? Uh, so let me un unpack that for you uh, a bit here, what Wesley is saying here. Um, again, think of that person who's come, come to Wesley for counsel, okay? Uh, think of the auto salutis, the order of salvation. They are along the way. They are on the path of salvation, okay? They are under conviction of sin. What should they do? Well, Wesley is arguing here, do you have time and opportunity? Is there time and opportunity? Then you can do something by means of the grace of God. So when Wesley is saying to, to repent and do fruits suitable for repentance, uh, and he's saying that they are in some sense necessary, in some sense necessary to justification, he is meaning that if there be time and opportunity. So if there's time and opportunity, in other words, we haven't entered in yet, what can we do? Well, go to church, talk to people, see other people's faith, um, pray, read the Bible, fast, do all of those things. Uh, they will be the means through which God can communicate Saving, saving grace, okay? Uh, now, the question uh, becomes, of course, uh, this issue uh, in terms of these works suitable for repentance. So let me cite for you something that the Methodist Conference in 1770 argued, what they stated. So this is much later. This is not the first conference in 1744 but this is a later conference. And um, listen to this. It shows the continuity of Wesley's teaching. We have received it as a maxim that a man is to do nothing in order to justification. Nothing can be more false. Whoever desires to find favor with God should cease from evil <laughs> Learn to do good. Uh, whoever repents should do works meet for repentance. Okay? Uh, and so what Wesley is saying there, it's, it's actually a very balanced statement. What he's saying there is if there be time and opportunity, and for most people there will be. There will be time and opportunity. So he's saying then works suitable for repentance are in some sense necessary to justification. Uh, 
they will not justify us because we're justified by Jesus Christ. We're justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But they are the path the, in the interim that points to justification and regeneration, okay? Which if we willingly neglect, Wesley writes, we can hardly expect to be justified at all, okay? So that uh, is an important issue uh, to be sure. Um, let me see. Uh, I know we go, we have time, generous time. Oh.